Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. Welcome back, folks. I hope you had a good break. Uh, Mr. Brockler, you may call your next witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. William Sather, please. Solemnly swore or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. Can hand me that photograph there. Oh, yes. Susan. All right. Sir, could you please tell us your full name after you get some water? <laughs> do that just quickly. Uh, my full name is William Sather. And could you please spell your first and last names? My first name is spelled W-I-L-L-I-A-M. My last name is spelled S, as in Sam, A-T-H-E-R. Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, would you please tell us what you do for a living? I'm a faculty member at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. What do you do in that capacity out there? Uh, uh, in my capacity, I, so I have a, a PhD, so I'm a research scientist, uh, and so I'm engaged in teaching uh, part-time, uh, like all other PhDs at our school, and uh, I run a research laboratory, uh, which is a typical thing for somebody that, that's standard for a professor at a medical school. How long have you been at CU? This is, uh, I think it's my 20th year. Now, prior to CU, what was the path you took education-wise to get there? Uh, how far back do I go, sir? Um, college? <laughs> we've never gone past sixth grade, so okay. if you... Okay. I'll start with college, maybe. So I was a uh, uh, biophysics student at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, and then I was a graduate student in physiology and biophysics at the University of Washington, and I earned a PhD in that field there uh, in Seattle. And then I was a uh, postdoctoral researcher uh, at... Uh, postdoctoral researcher, so post-PhD, uh, in France, Paris, France, at the École Normale Superior, superior. Common spelling? Common spelling is fine. Uh, and then I was also a postdoctoral researcher for uh, three more years at Stanford University from where I was hired uh, to be, to, to come here. All right, and do me a favor, would you bend that microphone just a little bit closer to your mouth just so yes, it's a little bit easier to hear. And, and tell me, doctor, um, is there a specific place within the CU school that you are assigned? Uh, my positions are, uh, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Pharmacology. That's my primary position. I'm also a member of the Neuroscience Training Program, which uh, is a, a graduate training program uh, for doctoral students. And it's actually the, the entity that hired me. <laughs> I'm the only one at the University of Colorado in that uh, situation, as it turns out. How long have you been associated with the Neuroscience Program? From day one, so for 20 years. So they actually hired me, and, and it was joint with pharmacology. It was an unusual uh, thing, and I'm the only faculty member left like that. There were three of us at the time. Um, th we don't hire people in the neuroscience program directly anymore. We're, they're hired into departments only. And so my primary position, as I say, is the Department of Pharmacology. But I have a, a longstanding uh, central relationship with the neuroscience <laughs> training program. Within that neuroscience program, what do you do? Uh, within that program, I am uh, I direct uh, uh, one course, one required course. We have three of these uh, sequence, roughly quarters, the fall, winter, and spring quarters of the first year. Uh, this is a course, the one that I direct in the fall, uh, is uh, uh, required for all of the neuroscience uh, uh, training program students. So that's one of the things that I do. What's it called? That course is called Cellular and Molecular Neurobiology. And which part of the year is it taught in? So that's taught uh, starting from the very beginning of the, of the first year, so at the last days of August uh, through uh, uh, the beginning of November. Okay, what else do you do for neuroscience? Uh, because I'm a, the director of that course, I'm, that puts me on the, the curriculum committee. That, that's a committee that uh, you know, revises, designs, updates our, 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 our curriculum for our training uh, program periodically. Uh, I've also, uh, because of that course really, uh, often served, in effect, always have served on the uh, oral examining committees that we have in June to determine if our first year students are, are on track uh, for proceeding forward in the program. And we've had uh, Dr. Sukumar V. Vijay Raghavan. Yes. I'm sorry. 
Vijay Yaragavan. It's not, yeah. <laughs> Get the spelling later. Um, and he's described for us how the whole program fits together. So what I want to ask you about specifically is to go back in time now to 2011-2012, that school year. Did you teach that mandatory first block course from approximately the end of August to November in 2011? Yes, I did. And was the defendant seated over here in khaki-ish pants and a brownish shirt with glasses, beard, mustache? Was he in that course? Yes, he was. How many other students were in that course? Uh, that year, there were about 10 students total. Uh, most of those students are neuroscience students. Some are in other PhD training programs on our campus. They're taking the courses and electives. Now, do you recall the defendant being in that course back then? I do. Give us your uh, observations of him, your perception of his affect, presentation, that sort of thing. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, he sat uh, most commonly right near the front of the, uh, the classroom, which is usually a very good sign for students, that they're going to be active and interactive and engaged. But in fact, he was generally the opposite of that and uh, didn't uh, uh, interact a lot. And so how do you interact in class? Well, faculty ask questions, and maybe anybody could answer them, anybody in the group of 10. And you just put your hand up and maybe say something. And that didn't happen very much at all, uh, really never. And also, sometimes our faculty uh, will, it's a team taught course, I should note, and so it wasn't just me. Uh, and so faculty might uh, ask a specific person a question. And sometimes we're persistent about that, sometimes we move on easily. But it, again, there just wasn't very much uh, engagement and, and, and very little eye contact was made. Um, and so I would characterize that. I was somewhat concerned about that, you know, not terribly concerned, but I knew that this was not the best uh, sign for a student. I liked that he sat at the front of the course, but I did not like that he didn't interact more because science is actually a, a, a group activity and you're going to have to talk to people about what you do and you're going to have to listen to them too. And people are people. You have to find a way to interact with them. And that was not happening in our classroom. And it was a classroom where it was small enough that interaction was possible. It's, it's entirely possible to interrupt faculty and, 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 and ask them things or make observations. And that just wasn't happening for, for, for this particular student. Um, so, Let me ask you, over the course of your time in, in teaching, how many students do you think that you've had the opportunity to observe in a setting like that or teach in a setting like that? Uh, so I, yeah, I've, I've taught for 20 years. And most of the classes, graduate classes, range from as little as three students to maybe as much as 10. There are some larger ones with 60 students in them, but I only do that like once or twice a year. I don't know. I'd suppose uh, total, uh, something on the order of 100 students, maybe more. In those 100 students that you had over these 20-ish or so years, have you had students who were less than interactive or quiet before? Yeah, that, that is something. So, so students are often shy. Uh, a lot of scientists are not the most outgoing and, and talkative kinds of people. They may be very bright or not. Uh, and, and, and so they don't always engage very well. And that's, that's, a, that's an issue. That's why I was concerned. I mean, I know this happens. It's not particular to our program. It's, it's, it's something we, we're all familiar with this issue. Many of us were actually more shy when we were younger. Uh, and, and so you, you look for ways to actually try to promote interaction in a hallway, after class, arrive early. Maybe they come by your office with questions, simple questions, and you try to engage them a little bit. And that's a common issue as a professor, to try to draw out students and get them to interact and, and become excited and motivated about what they want to do with their lives. And so it was on the, on the, definitely on the low end of interactivity, and I was concerned. But we've had other students like that, and uh, um, you know, it's, a, it's a common uh, situation in graduate school. With the course permission, could I have uh, published D8, please? Yes. And you've already described it, but just to put it in a visual perspective for us, Doctor, can you see that? Yes, sir. W would you do me a favor, um, ma'am, and I think it's this, the lower box down there that says cellular, molecular. <coughs> yeah, can you grande that thing? Is that the course that you're talking about? That is about? the course. And, and those are the appropriate dates for it back in 2011? Yes, those are the appropriate dates. Okay, thank you for that. And then on the other end of this, what we're going to talk about are the uh, preliminary exams, the oral ones. And, and if, ma'am, thank you if you'd make that a little bit bigger too. 
That's when the oral exams were? That's correct. And that's you on there? That is. And, and I think we've already heard Dr. Fenninger sadly passed. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. And you can take down D8. Thank you, ma'am. Um, in, in terms of your interest in wanting to help these students become more inter interactive, especially the ones that come a little shy, a little quieter, two things. One, have you always been successful in that? No, I've not always been successful at that. Uh, it's a, you know, it's, you are dealing with young adults, they're not kids, and, and you're hoping that they have initiative and that they come to see you. And a lot of opportunities if they struggle with a particular lecture of clarity or they miss class or part of a class or have to leave early. There are a lot of reasons to come by and talk to the course director. Who's an organizer? That doesn't mean that I'm the primary teacher at all. I'm just one of a group of teachers. And then the, the, the word director just means that you, you essentially organize the schedule. Who's going to do what uh, on the faculty? And, but that means that's the, you're the contact person for the students to come by and say, I, you know, when are we going to get the grades uh, handed back, the, ex the, the graded exams, that sort of thing. So. I have an opportunity in that role to usually talk to students uh, at some point, and, and that, uh, that didn't happen uh, really ever. In fact, did the defendant ever come by your office for any of these opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one time with you? I don't recall him ever coming by my office, no. Now listen, give us some sense of the interaction between being interactive, sorry, and being a successful scientist. In your opinion, how important are those, is the interactivity piece? Well, it's very important. It's, ha it's hard to persuade people that your work is, your research is very interesting and important and, and, and going to have any consequences if you can't talk with people. So it's, it's critical on the research side to be able to do that. The writing side is also very, very important. And then all of us are teachers. And so it's pretty hard to teach if you're not going to be interactive with your students. And so you do, you, you know, it's a fundamental quality to be able to talk uh, in, in, a, in a clear and effective and persuasive way many times. And also as, a, as a running a research group, uh, that means you will have graduate students working for their PhD or uh, postdoctoral people who, who already have a PhD but they're working in your lab and they're going to be looking for a faculty position or a position in, in, in industry perhaps in, in two or three years. And so you're their mentor. And so you need to be able to encourage or guide or maybe discipline if things aren't going well, whatever. Uh, and, 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 and so there's a, it's really very important. If you're going to take on this role as a, as a university professor, this, you're going to communicate with people at a lot of different levels. So yeah, it's, it's, it's important. Does that become pretty obvious to students over the course of this first year of this demanding program? I don't know that it does, actually. We try to emphasize communication. There is a lot of the rotation, the post-rotational talks, which you had shown up here on the previous slide, for example, they're, they're, they're asked to present their, what they've been doing each, every three months or so, research-wise. And part of that is to get them good at, at standing in front of an audience and learning to explain things and to answer questions when they're nervous. And so that's, that's a big part of that, uh, to think on their feet, that sort of a thing. So we try, but I don't know how many of them get real far with that during the first year. Progress is made, for sure, but they have a long ways to go, usually. In your experience over these 20 years, um, is the fact that someone did extremely well in undergrad and had strong scores a guarantee that they're going to thrive in an environment like this? Uh, unfortunately, no, that's not a guarantee. Uh, it turns out that people uh, very commonly go to graduate school because they're good students. This has always been true. Everybody knows this. When you're a graduate student, you hear these stories. You know that this is the way it is. People decide or learn that, that, that research is not for them. It's a lot of boring work, <laughs> frankly, and, and a lot of setbacks, a lot of failure. And it turns out not to be so easy as reading books and, and passing tests for smart people. So no, it's, it's actually a well-known phenotype, the bright student who is a washout uh, in graduate school. Uh, and it's hard to predict. Let's talk about now the next time, and, and I should have asked this, I'm presupposing this, by the end of this course in November, between then and June the 7th, did you have any interaction with the defendant in the classroom setting? No, I didn't have any other contact with him between the end of the course and the oral exam. Okay, so sure. let's fast forward to June 7th for these oral prelims. You have a certain uh, expertise, and I think you've described it as somewhat of a secretarial role in managing these things. Tell us about that. So as the, as the chair of that committee, as you're asking me, yeah, so, so I was officially uh, designated perhaps the day before <laughs> as chair of one of the two uh, uh, examining committees. The committees had coordinated questions uh, so that they, the same, we would have a person ask about molecular and cellular level neuroscience in one uh, committee and, and, and another person in the other committee. And so we had talked with each other your partner and the other committee in advance so the questioning would be 
similar line of questioning uh, uh, across the committees. Then a chair is, is, is like I said, like Monroe Labs, you said, is, it's, it's much like being a secretary. They were timed exams. We had one hour total, and so the student had to come in, and then we had to be done, and we had to have some time to discuss what we felt, and we each had to have about 15 minutes of each of the three committee members, that is, to ask the questions that we wanted to ask about. And so it was my job to look at my watch and, and keep a little bit of track of time. And then at the end, uh, to synthesize the discussion that uh, the three committee members had, including myself, and then walk down the hall to our program director, Sukumar Vijay Raghavan, and tell him what Vijay Raghavan, the only long name on this list. Yes. Um, and sir, let me ask you this then. So this particular format that was used on June the 7th, 2012, was it a relatively new format that neuroscience had, had developed? Yes, it was a, a new examining format. And uh, it was not just the neuroscience program that had uh, done this. It was actually a school-wide initiative. And we were, um, well, some of us didn't even want to change the format to this uh, particular examining thing. But we, were, we, we, we wanted to fit in with the rest of the training programs at our institution. Not a big fan of the oral board format, or was there some other aspect that you didn't like? Well, of course, this is a personal opinion, yes. but yes, I preferred uh, the written format, which we had used for many, many years, because it's a lower stress uh, way of evaluating your first year students, and it's traditional to do that, whereas oral examination at the end of the second year is, is traditional, not only at our institution, but throughout the country. So this was an experiment, and, which we have retained, and so we don't think it was a bad experiment in the end, but, but, uh, but I would have preferred uh, the standard written uh, examination. For this particular exam, what does it cover? So it covers what the students have learned in, during the first year. You can imagine uh, examining somebody for less than an hour on what they've learned in a year is a bit um, complicated. So we, we couldn't possibly know what they'd learned, everything they'd learned about. So we, we, we chose questions that were representative of the different fields that the students had been required to learn about and to, to master. And so they were, they were intended to be sort of questions where they would have to synthesize ideas and reason their way to uh, good answers on their feet, probably using a whiteboard to, to illustrate some of their ideas. Um, so that was uh, the exam. Prior to the exam, other than notifying the students that they have these prelims that are going to cover the information they should have mastered over the preceding year, do you in advance tell the students, here are the individual questions we're going to ask, or here are the individual areas to have mastered, or is it up to them to sort of be prepared? It is up to the students to be prepared. Uh, they will commonly talk to the, uh, their older peers, who are second, third, fourth year students, and ask what happened uh, behind closed doors, and they'll have a sense of that. And they, they usually meet with some faculty members, not the examiners, but some other, fa their first year advisor or possibly the program director, to you know, get some feedback about what's going to happen here, because they're often very, very nervous about it. They know they could be dismissed from the program, and uh, for, for, for a failure to do well on this exam, that actually doesn't happen very much. But they're nonetheless extremely nervous, almost all of them. Uh -huh. In terms of, we've heard uh, Dr. Freed say, listen, the last thing in my rotation was May 17th. It was a presentation. So between May 17th and June 7th, what is the expectation of what these first-year students should be doing? Yeah, so during that period, normally the students would probably be spending a lot of time studying uh, what they had learned in the three mandatory classes that they take or required classes that they take during the first year, including the one that I directed. And, and uh, they might even go and ask uh, lecturers in that, those courses, you know, I struggled with this or I never really understood this or I'm, I'm reviewing these notes and I, I want to ask you about this stuff because I, I know I have my exam coming up. So that's usually what they're doing full time. I mean, so there's got to be some level of initiative here. Is that fair? Yes. And that's, this, in fact, uh, you know, that's the purpose of a PhD, period. A uh, PhD means you are able to do research on your own without guidance. That's, so ultimately, when you earn a PhD, that's all that it means. It doesn't actually mean that you know things. It, it means you know how to teach yourself things so that you can learn. That's all it means. <coughs> so that's important. You've described the level of stress that occurs with these first-year students in this kind of a setting. And you said not a lot of people 
fail out of the program. How many people, in your estimation, having done this for 20 years, do uh, poorly on the preliminary examination? So that's a little bit difficult to answer. Uh, a lot of them don't do very well, and the faculty are frequently disappointed. That doesn't mean that they failed, though. They're just their first-year students. It's like with little children. They, they don't do as well as you're hoping they're going to do, but they're working their way forward. But, but really poor performances, you know, 10%, 20%, something like that, where it's really you probably should not continue on, would, be, would maybe be in your mind as, as a faculty member. Now, describe for us, then, if you would, how did the defendant do on June the 7th in his preliminary or, uh, examination? Yeah, so the defendant uh, had, a, had a difficult uh, a day uh, during our exam. Um, it, it was interesting. He, uh, he, he didn't seem very uh, strongly engaged with the examiners. And so uh, what I mean by that is that uh, when we would ask questions, it was difficult to get him to... Uh, give good answers to the question, not just right answers, but I mean ones where it was like he was thinking about it. Maybe there were wrong answers, but at least he was thinking about it. It was hard. It was as though he may not have been fully engaged in the process. And one view of that I had too at the time. I was concerned immediately, as were the other examining uh, members. Uh, either he was so nervous that he was behaving this way, and that happens, or he didn't care, uh, and, and I couldn't tell. Uh, he just wasn't that. So one word that I remember uh, using with the investigators early on, I described him as being somewhat detached. Uh, and uh, another way of saying that is, is I, w I think he was not that strongly engaged in the process. This question has come up before from the jury, so I'll ask it now in light of that word. Did you perceive him to be detached from reality at any time? No, I didn't mean that he wasn't detached from reality. What I, what I meant was he was socially detached. He just, it was as though he didn't. You know, wasn't sure that this was an important thing, it wasn't worth his time, or maybe he was nervous and felt he wasn't doing well or wasn't going to do well, and so it wasn't even worth trying. Maybe he was giving up. I, that, that wasn't clear. But no, it wasn't a detachment from reality. He did respond to us. But, well, let, let's talk about that. He didn't seem, did he seem to you to be invested yep. in the process? Your no, Honor, if I can... I, 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 uh, thank you. Object. I, I think we're really getting to the level of speculation with regard to um, Mr. Holmes's behavior. I, so that's my objection. O overruled. Don't, don't speculate, please. You can testify based on your observations and what impressions you formed based on your observations, but don't speculate, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Can you uh, repeat the question? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Did he appear to you to be invested in this process and being successful at it? No, he didn't really. During this process, do you guys give indications to the students how they're doing, a thumbs down, a shaking of the head, or do you try to keep a poker face? We try, try very, very hard to maintain a poker face. Uh, we know they're nervous. Any sign of um, that they're struggling would, would would be bad for them. Some of them really respond badly to that, so we're, we're nervous ourselves that they will do poorly. Uh, we do try to be somewhat encouraging, uh, and if they do, if they say something that's really, wow, that was not very good, we don't give them any sign that we're the least bit concerned. Uh, so. so none of the students when they leave know for sure whether they've passed or failed? They don't know. We don't tell them anything about it, and we try not to give that away. After the performance on these prelim exams, historically, have you had students drop out of the program? Yes, we have had students drop out after the oral exams. That's a common occurrence, actually. We, we, we've not actually had to dismiss very many students and tell them you're, you're not working out. More commonly, they simply decide that on their own. And we, we often agree uh, with them. Uh, so that's a typical outcome. In this particular case, based on the observations of the defendant on June 7th, by you and, and the other two professors, had you made a decision about whether or not to dismiss the defendant or a different course of action? We had not made a, a decision about dismissal or not. That's, that's certainly not even our, our authority. Uh, all we can do is, is, is decide whether we thought that was a passing performance or a failing performance. And the committee decided that it was a failing performance. Uh, and there was a little bit of debate about that, but, uh, but as a committee, we, we debate. And so we... Uh, so we had decided that he had not passed the examination. And what did you do with that information? 
So after, with that uh, discussion, then I walked down to Sukumar Vijay Raghavan's office, and I uh, told him that he uh, that the defendant had not passed the examination, and uh, and I wondered what we would need to do about that, and because we, we had not actually really run into that problem before with your oral exams, that is. What did you guys end up deciding, or was that not even a decision you got to participate in? I didn't really get to participate in that decision. I mean, Sukumar was interested in what I thought, but that's not my job, and so it was, it was sort of an initial, what do we do? That was the, the, the and he had to think about that then uh, over the next few days, and I imagine he's testified about that. I forgot to ask you some questions about how he appeared in front of you on that day. Was he on time? The student? Yeah. Yes, he was. Was he dressed, I guess, consistent with how he'd been dressed in the past? Uh, yes, he was dressed as graduate students are often are, yes. No, well, I guess given that framework. Casually. <laughs> yeah, no, no issues with personal hygiene, nothing like that? Uh, there were no issues with personal hygiene or anything that would stand out. Okay. Um, doctor, do you have any idea or knowledge of what the defendant was doing in the month preceding that June 7th preliminary examination? Uh, no, I, I had no contact with uh, the defendant, and I don't know uh, anything about what he was doing at that time. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Nothing else, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Cross-examination, Ms. Higgs? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. I want to um, I want to first talk to you about the neuroscience program class that you taught in the fall, okay? And if we could put up uh, Defense Exhibit Eight again, please. And if we could, um, what I want to ask you about is this class that you've already testified about. Um, the course dates were, were from August 31st to November 2nd. Is that about right? That is correct. And from this diagram, can you tell what the core, kind of those core five classes are, what they represent that are just above your class that you talked about? Ah, uh, yes. Cores one, two, three, four, five, the Roman numeral courses. Those are um, core courses that all of the graduate students in the first year uh, that is the PhD uh, uh, candidacy students in the first year at our university take. So neuroscience students all take that, but so do all the physiology or pharmacology or biochemistry students. So it's, it's, that's a course of about 60 students. Much larger course than the um, courses represented below that, is that right? right? That's right. Okay. And I do teach in that course too as well, one day. <laughs> in the core courses? Yes, one. Okay. Um, so you have one lecture that you come give at some point between... August and December in the core courses? It's actually the same time. It's in September. Okay. Um, do you have any recollection of Mr. Holmes in that class? No, I do not. Okay. Um, when you talk about the topics for the oral preliminary examinations, you said it was from the neuroscience. Would, would it, those questions would have not come then from the core classes. Is that right? That is correct. So it would come from cellular and molecular neurobiology, right? Yes. Uh, fundamentals of neurobiology, or some people have called that s s systems That's correct. Okay. And developmental neurobiology, right? Yes, that's all correct. If I could um, clarify slightly. The core courses are, for our students, is background material. Uh, and so, you know, how cells work, what, how they're built generally. Specifically, we would ask them about how nerve cells do things, but that would assume some knowledge of cells generally, which is taught in the core. Uh, course one, two, three, four, five. So, okay. so the examiners are neuroscientists who ask uh, questions from those three courses that, that you listed. So if somebody was, uh, I just want to clarify what that means. So the questions actually come from those three uh, courses I mentioned, but there could be some background information from the core classes that might be relevant to explaining? That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, 
And I see that uh, the oral preliminary exam on there is dated June 7th, and the last date of those three classes would be May, May 9th, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Does that reflect about what you recall from that year, from 2011 to 2012? Well, I, you know, I have no participation in the spring courses, so, I mean, you know, I, I can read what you can read, and I know what the curriculum says, but... And that sounds about right to you? Yeah. Okay. Um, we can take that down. Thank you. So just I want to clarify about that cellular, cellular and molecular neurobiology class. You were the director for that class, right? I was the director for that course, yes. But you don't attend every single class, is that right? No, but that year I attended much more than half because that was the first year that I directed that course. I've directed other courses, but that was the first year I directed that course, and I was interested in modernizing uh, the course quite a bit. And so it actually looks quite different now, for example. And so I wanted to know what my colleagues were teaching and, uh, and I wanted to see how things worked. So I went to a lot of lectures. So it wasn't, for some other professors, they've indicated they just kind of show up the one week that they're teaching and that's it. But for you, you were there at least during half of the classes. Yes. So not only did you see Mr. Holmes interact um, in the class that you taught, but you also saw him, or I should, I should say, not interact, right, um, with regard to the other professors inside the classroom. Is that right? That is definitely right. Okay. Um, and you've already indicated that Mr. Holmes had, did not voluntarily interact in the class. Is that right? Yes. Um, if he was called on, I mean, he did okay with responding to questions. Is that also fair to say? If he was called upon directly, he gave answers, yes. They might be quite compact, but, but he did answer. So when you say compact, do you mean kind of short? He didn't use a lot of words to express himself. Is that right? Yeah, it was a bit terse. Right. Um, you said that some of the reasons a student might uh, come see you during that class would be if uh, they were struggling with the materials or if they missed a class, something along those lines. Yeah, I would be the first person they would probably come see, and then I might as like as not suggest they go talk to the, the professor who had taught that course. But they, you know, typically you would see the director. Right. Um, now, m with Mr. Holmes, he didn't miss any of the classes that you're aware of, correct? I don't recall him missing anything, though. No. Okay. Um, you talked about looking for ways to promote interaction um, or, you know, sort of that during this first year with the neuroscience students, part of what you're doing is trying to teach them how to interact and be persuasive. Is that right? Yes, and how to think on their feet and, 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 uh, and that they need to, well, it's also important for the teachers to know whether the students are learning things uh, through communication back and forth. And one-way communication doesn't work very well for that. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons I think that students need to kind of be persuasive uh, once they become, once they get their PhD is, is because they have to really spend quite a bit of time um, finding money to fund their labs. Is that right? That is definitely right. You have to be very persuasive to uh, bring in money. And in fact, with your lab, I, I understand that you spend quite a bit of time looking for funding for your lab. Is that right? Yes, like all other professors. Yeah. Yes, like everyone at the school. Yes. Okay. And all the professors have their own lab. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So a couple of the other things that um, you want to, that, is, that are important um, for students to be able to do, would, especially in the lab environment, is, is sort of this teamwork idea, to, to work on the team of people toward the common goal of the research of the lab. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm not quite sure what the question there is. So That's if it's do they have to interact and work with other people, yes. Uh, so yes. Um, there is, there's nothing though that, there's no like set of guidelines on a piece of paper that you hand out to the students and say, this is what we expect you to be able to do by the end of the year and these are the things that are important. Um, you just want them to figure out that stuff on their own throughout the year. Is that right? That's actually pretty accurate. Okay. Um,
I'm just going to go through my notes so I'm making sure I don't miss questions. So if I'm silent, be patient with me. I would appreciate that. When you talk about Mr. Holmes' um, sort of inability to, or his failure to interact in the classroom environment, you said that other scientists, you've seen that with other first-year students. Is that right? Yes. That's that, it's not that uncommon. But for him, it was a bit further along the spectrum than, you said, at the lower end. Early yeah, I would, I would say it was, yeah, I, that's a fair statement. Along a spectrum, it was towards the lower end. It wasn't extreme, but it was, you know, going, going towards the really a level of interactivity or lack of interactivity that you'd, you, you'd be concerned about his performance as a student okay. over the coming years. Now, I want to jump ahead to the preliminary exams at the end of the year. You said that this is sort of a new structure that you have put in place at the neuroscience school th this year, doing the oral exams versus previous written exams. Is that right? Yes. And I also understand that um, when you have these neuroscience students in your school for the first year, you're putting quite a bit of effort into them. Is that reasonable? Yes, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's not the major activity of professors, but there is a significant amount of time invested by the, the members of our training faculty in various aspects of training, formal teaching, but also mentoring in the research rotations in the laboratories and um, helping them with their rotation presentations, the practice talks, the feedback that that needs to be fixed in this way or this illustration needs to be improved, people aren't going to understand what you're saying. That sort of thing. So there's actually a fair amount of investment by the program, yes. Would, would you say, you would say that um, at, by the end of the year, the, you're really interested in trying to retain these students if you can and keep them growing and learning through the program? Yes, we definitely want to keep the students. We are encouraged to keep the students. And in, when you were doing this oral exam, you're not coming up with super tricky questions. Is that right? It's the opposite. Right. We try to ask questions that they can definitely answer. Quite frankly, I think this, that you had made the exam a little bit easier for the students by this point in time in 2012. Is that um, correct? I don't know if we've made it easier. I think we've often felt that the exams are very easy and that decades ago when, when current faculty were students, exams were quite difficult. They were much longer. Um, but we don't want our students to fail, and we don't want them to be traumatized. And so we've, we've worked to actually make this what we thought would be a more effective uh, procedure. Okay. You have described your interpretation of Mr. Holmes' behavior in that um, particular exam. Now, you've also uh, described that Mr. Holmes, in that exam, was increasingly scattered as the exam went on. Is that right? I don't know if I said he was increasingly scattered, did I? Is, are you looking at notes from an interview back then? Well, you recall speaking with Detective Fredrickson on August 27th of 2012? Yeah, uh, yes, I do. Okay. And um, that is what you indicated to Detective Fredrickson, uh, is that he became increasingly scattered and nervous as the exam went on. Well, okay, so, uh, yeah, I would say he was scattered. That's certainly my recollection now. Increasingly, I may have said that, I was actually the first examiner, mm -hmm. and as I listened to the second and third examiners, um, I know that during the second set of questions from the second examiner that, that there was where I started to become concerned, and in general, the other examiners were too. Okay. So and he may I have done better with my part. I want to get to that second question. I'm going to ask you some specific questions about that. But you've also said that he was disorganized in his answers. That's yes. a phrase that you used, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, that he was only really able to, I think, scratch the surface with regard to these topics. Is that right? That is also correct. You brought up um, that second question. And that second question, um, Mr. Holmes 
spent a lot of time trying to discuss with you uh, the anatomy of the organ that was the top of, of that question. Is that right? Yes, it was the ear. <laughs> and that wasn't really the question, to tell you what the anatomy of the organ was. Is that right? That's right. That would be sort of background information um, for that question. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And he didn't get the anatomy of the organ correct. Is that right? Well, he spent a lot of time diagramming the external ear, what we all think of as the ear, what you can see. And what, of course, we were interested in was very little about that. It's important for hearing, but we were interested in the, in the brain circuitry, uh, how, the, how your brain is organized to detect sounds from over here versus over there. And we wanted him to talk about that. And it was and difficult for the examiner to direct him to the guts of the question. And that's, so we felt, you know, it was, we tried several gentle ways of doing that, and it, it we didn't get very far with that. Okay. One of the things that you do as examiners is when you see a student maybe kind of going off, you can give gentle prompts to sort of bring them back to the focus of the question, right? Yes, we okay. definitely do that. And Mr. Holmes was not able to um, sort of understand your prompts and get back to the focus of the question. Is that right? That's right. And okay. the committee members were becoming privately frustrated by that. Okay. Now, when you talked about all of the interpretations you had of his behavior during that examination, you didn't actually sit down and say, and ask him, like, what's going on here? Why are you unable to do this? Is that right? No, we didn't do that. And that, would, that would have traumatized him. <laughs> and you're not supposed to do that in no. that exam. And you didn't speak with him afterwards. Is that right? No, we don't speak to them afterwards. Okay. So you never really... Um, were able to clarify with him at all what was going on with him during that examination. Is that That's right? right. We did not know. Okay. In the, um, I just have a few more questions for you. The plan was to um, offer Mr. Holmes another opportunity to retake that examination. Is that right? That is right. And what you had decided that you would do in that second preliminary oral examination would be to give him more general topic areas to help focus him for the exam. Is that right? Yeah, so when you say we decided, that was not me. Okay. Uh, nor was it any members of the committee. Uh, we were uh, consulted, but we were basically told. Uh, this is what was going to happen. This was going to, and it was not, uh, and the idea was to confine the questioning a bit. So we have very general areas like cellular and molecular neurobiology in my course, and it was going to be, well, we want to ask something a little bit in this area. We're going, to, we're going to put some boundaries on what you need to be focused on because that was one of the concerns was that he was just not focused very well and he didn't know what we were saying even though we thought we were being clear. He just didn't know. And so that was the rationale for trying to focus bits. of the, We wouldn't tell him the questions, but we would tell him general areas to focus on. Okay. Um, in the times that you had, um, that you interacted with Mr. Holmes, uh, he was never rude or unprofessional with you, is that right? No, he was not. Okay. He never kind of showed up to class dressed strangely or his hair dyed weird, is that right? That's right. Um, he never really ever acted angry with you at all, is that right? No, he was never angry with any of his teachers as far as I know. He didn't seem to also really draw attention to himself at all, is that right? No, he didn't. Okay. In he fact, it, it was the opposite. Exactly. Um, I'm just going to check with my colleagues to see if there's any more questions, but I think we might be done. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sather. Thank you. Mr. Brockley, do you have a redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Hey, sir, um, one of the questions that Ms. Higgs asked you about was uh, about this gentle prompting to try to see if you could focus him on the subject matter, and the question was phrased in the form of he didn't have the ability to do it, and I'm going to ask you if you know whether or not it was a matter of ability or will. No, we did not know what was the issue. As, we, as I said, one of the things we, we, we considered and discussed afterwards was he just too nervous, so he wasn't listening very well as people we, we were familiar with this, that students, when they're nervous, they are not good listeners. So it was possible he could have, but didn't just because of nerves. Uh, it's possible he didn't, uh, was, just wasn't interested in what we were asking him about. We didn't know, uh, but that's, we talked about that afterwards. Have you ever run into someone who has, um, whether in a written exam or oral exam, they don't know the answer, but they know enough that they can give an answer, 
and they just continue to talk about all the things that they remember and they know. Have you ever had that? Objection, Your Honor. I uh, object to relevance. Overruled. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, that actually happens uh, both in oral and written exams. Is this the, what you saw the defendant do? Is this uh, something in that range, or do you know? I don't know, but we certainly considered that, and as a committee, we discussed it as though he was, particularly the question about the ear, there were other ones like this, but the idea we were asking about was hearing, and he was describing the structure of the external ear. It's like we, were, we could not uh, redirect him to what we thought was important and he needed to tell us about, and, we, and he was taking a lot of time drawing this, this uh, tangentially relevant you know, ear structure, and we wanted to, to do something else, and, and without... You know, say, hey, knock it up. We, we did not want to really rattle him either, so it was a bit tricky. Uh, and I think we, we felt we had not done the best job of redirecting him um, because we, we, we failed. <laughs> he, he took up quite a bit of time with that. Well, that's the next question I was going to ask is, could you tell whether or not he appeared to you to be trying to run out the clock on an answer? You know, I don't know that that was what he was doing, but it, that was certainly one of the interpretations that we had. We, we thought about it and talked about it as a committee. Now, the answer that he did provide and what he was drawing with the ear, was that at least accurate, what he was drawing? Yeah, he was accurately describing uh, the external structure of the ear. And that ha we have ears of this shape for a particular reason, to hear certain kinds of sounds, tones that we're good at hearing and not others. And that he was, he was accurate in describing that. That wasn't really the question. It was, it was tangential to what the fundamental question was, however. So. But at the end of the day, we just don't know why he didn't know or wouldn't answer the questions that you posed. We didn't know in the end. That's right. Not the worst performance you've ever seen out of any student? No, it was not the worst performance. Based on what you saw, I mean, and again, I know this isn't your decision, but had you concluded there's no way on God's green earth this guy's ever going to be a scientist? No, we had not concluded that. I had not concluded that. Uh, uh, no, it was possible that he, uh, it, it, it could have all been ascribed to nerves. We did not know, but it could have been, and we discussed that. And so uh, we know that uh, students do surprisingly poorly when they're nervous at times. And, and, and when you give them a, a chance to do it again, the exam, they may do fine. And you will be surprised many years later that that very nervous person, uh, as they've grown in confidence and expertise, they do surprisingly well. So we don't really know. Based on your observations and your contact with the defendant then, I, I presume you didn't run to Dr. Sukumar and say, hey, you've got to get this guy out of the program right now, get him off the campus. No, no, no. We, 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 we did not. Our, our concern as a committee was what is our next move as a program? What do we do? And, and, and the issue of a continuation of the exam, that is sort of a retake, you could call it, that we use this word continuation, which would be administered later on that summer, that came up as a suggestion initially with uh, Sukumar Vijay Uraghavan. Uh, and uh, But I didn't even know that was going to happen that particular day. Uh, it turned out that's what he decided with his uh, other advisors. Thank you. Sir, may I have a moment? Yes. Nothing else, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Ms. Higgs, do you have any recross? Yes, Your Honor, just briefly. Um, Dr. Sather, you are not a clinical psychiatrist, correct? I am not. You are not a clinical psychologist, correct? I am not. Uh, you may work in, in research, but you do not actually see patients for mental disease or mental illness. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And so while you have suggested many possibilities for Mr. Holmes' behavior in that preliminary examination, it is also quite possible that, quite frankly, Mr. Holmes was disorganized because he was suffering from mental illness, something that you could not see. Is that right? Lack of foundation. Sustain and lack of foundation. You can rephrase the question if you want, Ms. Higgs. I can just have one moment? Yes. So when you talk about the fact that it may have been disinterest or nerves, um, you actually do not know what it was, and it could have been something else going on, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Sir? It looks like the jury has some questions for you. Would you give us a moment, please? Uh, Thank you. You can just sit right here. Thank you.
Uh, would council please approach? Doctor, the jury has submitted a question that uh, I have determined is appropriate based on the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law. The question is as follows. From the first time that you met the defendant until the last contact with him, did he change in any noticeable way? Uh, did he change in any noticeable way? Uh, yeah. That's not that easy a question to answer, um, surprisingly. It, 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 I would say it's possible he changed some, but it wasn't very obvious to me. He was uh, always uh, disengaged. He, uh, in class, he kept his eyes down. He didn't uh, ask a lot of questions of any sort, and he didn't interact with me much. So it's, it's really difficult to answer your, your question. Uh, and then during the oral exam, where he, he did have to answer, uh, questions. The problem is, what do I compare that to? To a performance earlier in the year where he, he tended to let his classmates uh, interact with the faculty uh, mostly. Well, that's an understatement. He, he let his classmates do the interaction with professors as they would ask questions and so on. He let them uh, do all of the interacting. So it wasn't obvious to me that he changed at all. Did he? I, I can't say. Any follow-up questions based on, on that question, Mr. Brockler? One, Your Honor, with your permission, can I stay back here in the maze? That's fine, as long as you, uh, your microphone is on and you're standing up. Go ahead. Ma'am, yes, sir. Just to be clear, it, it sounds like the struggle to be able to quantify any difference at all is based on the fact that that last exposure to him was the single most amount of focused time you had on him and listening to him answer questions. Is that fair? That is a fair statement, yes. But other than that, you discern no difference with him? Yeah, given the limitations, how difficult it is to, to discern differences if there isn't much interaction. Yeah, I didn't see any particular changes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Ms. Higgs, do you have any follow-up questions? Dr. Sather, with regard to your contact throughout the, the school year with Mr. Holmes, it was all confined to schoolwork. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. You had no social interaction with him, correct? None. You had no discussions with him outside the information um, relevant to school. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Thank you. All right, doctor, thank you. May this witness be released from his subpoena? Yes, Your Honor. Is there any objection? All right, sir, thank you. Thank you. Call your next witness, please. People call Jamie Roars. of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. Please tell us your full name for the record and spell your first, middle, and last names. Jamie Rusty Roars, J-A-M-I-E R-U-S-T-Y R-O-H-R-S Ms. Tish McGuire, you may proceed with your direct examination. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Roars, were you at the Century 16 movie theater on July 19th of 2012 in Aurora, Colorado? I was. That go into the early morning of July 20th of it 2012. Did. What do you recall about the day of July 19th of 2012 prior to going to the movie theater that day? Um, I woke up sick that morning. Uh, you know, I wasn't feeling very good, and I had to work the next day. Um, so I was just hanging out in my pajamas all day watching, uh, watching my uh, two kids. Um, my uh, girlfriend's daughter at the time, she's now my wife, and um, my son, 
And so I was just hanging out at the house, and my wife went grocery shopping. And we're huge Batman fans, so, you know, she had been talking about it. Do you want to go tonight to the midnight, uh, midnight showing, or do you want to go tomorrow? And I was like, ah, you know, I have to work tomorrow, but it's not till uh, later on. So um, we ended, I told her to get the tickets. So she went and she got the tickets. And then she came back home, and we were just hanging out at the house, um, watching old school and playing, uh, what was it, um, family feud on her, ho on her cell phone and just enjoying the day. Did you get to go to the movies that night? We did. Right, and who did you go with? I went with my wife, Patricia. My could you state everyone's full name, please? Yeah, my wife, my wife, Patricia Legareta at the time. My uh, son, Ethan Ro Roars and um, my wife's daughter, Azariah Legareta. And how old was Ethan? Ethan was four months. And how old was Azariah? Four years. What time did you get to the theater that night? I would say around 11.50, 11.55. We were running a little bit late because my daughter loves, uh, loves the sour straws. So, and I mean, I had just graduated from pharmacy school and coming out with $88,000 in student loans. Sustain. All right, so what time did you guys get to the theater that night? 11.50, 11.55-ish. How'd you go about choosing your seats in the theater? Uh, we walked in, and uh, my wife's pretty shy, so um, she just wanted to sit in the front of the theater since the, it was so packed already. So um, I, I told her, no, no, hold on, you know, because I don't like to sit in the front of the movie theater. So we walked in and, you know, we walked to the left um, of the entrance because it's one main door. So we walked in and then I told her, look, there's three seats up there. I could hold Ethan as I can sit in the middle of us and you can sit on this side. And so that's how we found our seats. I, w I went up and I asked the, um, the people that were sitting there if those seats were taken. All right, Your Honor, if I could approach the witness with what's been marked as People's Exhibit 1158. Yes. <coughs> do you recognize this document? I do. What is that a document of? It's a document of the movie theater. All right, and did you notate on there where you were seated that night? I did. Also some things that you witnessed in the movie theater that night? I did. Does that fairly and accurately represent what you recall from the movie theater of July 20th, 2012? It does. Your Honor, at this time I'd move for the admission of People's Exhibit 1158. Is there any objection, Ms. Spengler? There is an objection. May we approach? Yes.
Ms. Tish McGuire, you must proceed as indicated. The objection is sustained in part and overruled in part. Can I see that, sir, please? Could you please show it to Ms. Fengler? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes. Okay, exhibit P-TR-1158 is admitted pursuant to my instructions here at the bench. Ms. Tish McGuire, you may proceed. So, after you took your seats that night with your family, what did you do while you were waiting for the movie to start? We were just hanging out, uh, people watching, and uh, my wife was looking at her phone on Facebook, showing uh, pictures to me of people dressed up like Batman, and... I mean, we went to the movie theater all dressed in our Batman shirts, too. Even Ethan had his little Batman onesie on. So, Did you recognize any people coming into the theater in particular? Uh, two. Um, really, there's a, a few that catch my mind. Uh, there was one couple that had a baby carrier, you know, and we were, we were like, look, we're not the only one that br brought a baby um, to the theater. And we had actually came to the Spider-Man, you know, which was a... I'm just going to stop you right there for that. Okay. At some point in time, did your movie begin that evening? It did. It did it um, around midnight and previews. Um, yeah, it did. What happened that evening? Um, we were just watching the movie, you know, it had just started. And the whole scene with Bane, you know, with the, the plane crash and then... Uh, all of a sudden, uh, this is a, a few minutes into the movie, um, 
I remember them showing a picture of Catwoman because she had just stolen uh, Bruce Wayne's diamonds. And then all of a sudden I, I hear the uh, exit door open, you know, and uh, I recall a couple things floating through, the, flying through the air, you know, and one, uh, my initial thought was a smoke bomb, you know, and I was thinking to myself, oh, you dumb kids, you, you know, you just ruined the movie, everyone has to leave. And I heard the door close, so I thought whoever did it just ran off, you know. And then the rate at which the uh, the smoke bomb, what I thought at the time, was going was, you know, it wasn't like any smoke bomb I had ever saw. So, And then uh, you immediately start coughing, and then I realized something else was going on. And I heard the exit door open again, and at that time, I, um, you know, I heard shots go off. I didn't even get a chance to look who came in the exit door. And I immediately told my wife to get down, you know, and I ducked down with Ethan and uh, just hearing gunshots and um, screaming. What do you recall doing after you had ducked down with Ethan? So I ducked down with uh, Ethan and um, something just didn't feel right. You know, I was under, you know, ducked down underneath the chair and, I look up and Ethan's head was exposed, you know. He had got caught in between the suit, two seats in front of us. So I tried pulling him through and he wasn't coming through the seat. So I uh, jumped over the seat with Ethan into the aisle in front of us. What happened after you had jumped down to the seats with Ethan? Yeah, I uh, remember laying down in the uh, aisle over with him and just, you know, hearing gunshots and screaming. And thinking to myself, you know, you're processing everything and, you know, I'm just thinking that whoever's doing this is, they're coming to kill us, you know. I, I can't just sit here. So I, uh, I made a run for it, you know. Um, so we ran down the stairs and um, at a point, you know, you realize you weren't going to make it. Just that, you know, people are dropping right in front of you and at the time, you feel like it's a nightmare, you know. You don't, you can't really tell if it's reality. You know it's reality, but your brain's trying to process it. And people are falling down dead, and other people are just diving out of the way. And I made it down to about the uh, second and third row, and I, I like, juked in uh, the second row. And, you know, people were just dropping there, and then I like ran back into the uh, stairway and I was, I, I mean, I was like, I have to run back up. So I ran back up and at that time I tripped on the stairway and landed on my forearm and, um, you know, I placed Ethan down there and uh, I was like, I have to look for a way out. And I remember seeing the, uh, the, you know, the balcony right there and so I ran over to it, and at that time, you know, the shots had probably stopped for, you know, I mean, to me it seemed a lot longer, but probably a second or two. And um, I looked over and was thinking if I could jump and if there was anyone there, you know, waiting to shoot me and, you know, and if I could jump with Ethan and if he'd make it. And I turned around to look for him, and I couldn't find him. So, and then at that time, shots started going off again, you know, really fast. And I was like, I have to jump or I'm going to die. So I jumped off over the balcony. And I was thinking to myself, you know, uh, when I was down there, you know, they're still in there. I have to go back and get my family. And, you know, I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't go back in there. I knew if I went back in there, I was going to get shot or I was going to get killed. So I ran out the movie theater thinking, uh, you know, I should call 911. So I ran out the movie theater through the concession session uh, concession area, and uh, we parked my truck over to the side. So I was trying to call 911, and I could already hear the uh, sirens, you know, coming. And I was thinking, well, what do what do I do next? So, you know, and I'm like, well, I. I don't know if they're gonna have a shootout with the cops. I don't know, you know, what's going on. So at that time I got in my truck and I drove across the parking lot right to the mall area 
<laughs> and I remember there were some girls and some other kids running, and I told them, get in the back of my truck. And they looked at me cause, like I was crazy because, I mean, they heard the uh, gunshots too. And, you know, and um, at that time I was just, you know, crying out. And I was dialing Patricia's phone over and over again. And all I could think in my head, it was, you know, they're all dead. You know, your family's done. 403-401. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Objection, 403-401. Um, sustained. Ask another question, please. At some point in time, were you able to get in touch with your family? I was. I was. Um, you know, uh, I got a, a phone call from a Colorado number, and, you know, I have a 505 area code since I'm from New Mexico. So, I mean, I don't get 303 area codes ever. So I, I was hoping it was Patricia. And you know, so I immediately picked up the phone and asked her, you know, you know, I was happy to hear her voice. And at the same time, I didn't know how to tell her that I lost our son in the movie theater, you know. And then she told me that she had Ethan and she had Azariah. So, and I asked if all of them were okay, and she said she had been shot, you know. So I immediately drove right back into the uh, parking lot of the movie theater and began searching for him. And... We found each other, and, uh, you know, she showed me her shot wound, and, I, you know, I told her to get in the vehicle. I'm going to stop you right there. At this time, Your Honor, I'd ask the court's permission for Mr. Roars to take the cordless microphone that's up there and to meet me at the model. Yes. All right, Mr. Roars, if you could kind of stand right here. And if you could first please describe, and kind of stand here so that you're, otherwise we kind of block, if you can come up close to me, sorry, I know you spent too much time next to me, but, um, okay, so if you could please tell the jury where you were seated, um, and if you could tell them where seats you were in, and um, Azariah and Patricia as well. Okay, so we were seated. Um, I would say there was a couple here. I was probably seated right here in one of these two aisles. And you where know. where was Azariah sitting and where was Patricia sitting in so, relation to you? You know, I'll go with this aisle. So I was uh, I was here, Azariah was here, and Patricia was here closer to the end. And where was Ethan again? Ethan was sitting on my lap. Okay, so Ethan is the four month old. Yeah, we were uh, oh, Ethan is the four-year-old, correct? Correct. Yeah, we... Uh, Four-month-old, sorry. Decided if, uh, that it'd be better for me to hold him since he was knocked out, you know... Um, sleeping. Sleeping, and we didn't want to deal with the taking in the carrier. Now, could you uh, describe for the jury on the model where it was that you saw that door open when the movie had started? It was over here. All right, and where was that um, stink bomb that you saw? Um, I would say it landed right over here somewhere. And were you able to see any flashes? I was. Where did you see flashes? Uh, all through the front of the theater. All right, and can you just put, just point that out a little bit better for the jury? R right over here in this area. Were you, were you able to see any smoke in the theater? Um, yeah. Where was it's, that? Um, it was kind of all around, around my area at least. So where um, was the area that you first jumped over the seats with Ethan? So um, if it was, you know, this aisle, I jumped over to this aisle, and we were laying right here. And could you describe, show the jury on the model where it was that you went with Ethan at first? Yeah, so I ran down here, you know, and people were getting shot or falling all around here, and so I ran, I would say, into this aisle right here, and, you know, everyone was falling down and screaming, so I decided to run back up the stairs, and then we tripped right over here or so, and uh, I placed Ethan down somewhere in that area. And was that the last time you saw Ethan inside the theater? That was. Okay, and then could you, de you described for the jury before like a balcony that you jumped over. Could you talk to the jury about what, or you described for the jury on the model where, what you were talking about? Yeah, it's this area right here. All right, and is this in fact where you jumped over? Um, somewhere around this, 
this step and this step. All right, and then can you show the jury on the model where you landed? I landed right over here. All right, and what happened when you landed? I landed on my ankle, you know, and uh, I mean, I immediately, immediately looked up to see if there were any other shooters, you know, waiting to shoot me in the stairs, and I didn't see anybody. And I was thinking to myself, you know, you gotta, you gotta run back in there, and you gotta get your family. And then, you know, the other side of me was saying, you know, you gotta, you gotta run out of here. You gotta get help. So, I ran out of here, and uh, was that back into the main area? Back into this main area, and there's a, a door right here that connects both these sides. You can either come, you know, a main door here, and you can either go left or you can go right. And then you went back to the main lobby. I did. And um, at any point in time, did you ever see the shooter in the theater? I did not. I tried. Uh, I tried to stay low and uh, try to stay out of the way because you know I. I thought to myself, if if I could see him, he could see me, and you know, then it's it's done. All right. Thank you. You can take your seat and turn off the microphone. Thank you very much. Were you able to drive your wife to the hospital that evening? I was. What hospital did you go to? I took her to a uh, university hospital. Were you able to seek medical attention for yourself while you were at university hospital? I was. Um, initially, you know, I was running off adrenaline, so I didn't really even feel my ankle, and I was more concerned about my wife's wounds than mine. And then, you know, as time went on and we were sitting there in the waiting room, uh, the adrenaline started going down and I looked at my ankle and it was really swollen so I asked them to take an x-ray of it. And were you informed that you had a sprained ankle? Yeah, um, they gave me some pain medication for my ankle and um, that, was, that was it. I mean, there were... Oh, <coughs> thing. Next question please. Okay. Your Honor, at this time I would just ask to clarify for the court that people's exhibit with the, modica the modifications we discussed at the bench will be admitted 1158, but I'm not asking to publish it at this time. It's been admitted. Thank yes. you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any cross-examination, Ms. Spengler? No. All right. The jury may have a question for you, sir. Give us a moment, please. Would uh, counsel please approach? Sir, the jury has submitted a question that, based on the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law, I have found is appropriate. The question is, did Ethan wake up during the shooting? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, when I realized something was wrong, when I initially ducked down, he was crying. And looky, I looked up, and you know, I could see him just crying and him looking at me and giving me his big eyes. Excuse me, injection 403. Sustain. All right, Ms. Tish McGuire, any follow-up questions based on that question? No, thank you very much, Your Honor. All right, any follow-up questions from you, Ms. Spengler? No. All right, sir, thank you. Ms. Tish McGuire, may this witness be released from his subpoena? Please, Your Honor. Is there any objection? No. All right, thank you, sir. Call your next witness, please. Amanda hernandez Mamihai. you raise your right hand so that I can administer an oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please be seated. <coughs> you can give me that exhibit there.
right, ma'am, tell us your full name, please, and spell your first, middle, and last names. My name is Amanda Hernandez Mamije, and my first name is A-M-A-N-D-A -A Hernandez, H-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-Z, Mamije, M-E-M-I-J-E. -E. All right, thank you, Ms. Sish McGuire. You may proceed with your direct examination. Were you at the Century 16 movie theater in Aurora, Colorado on July 19th of 2012? Yes, I was. Did that go into the early morning hours of July 20th of 2012? Uh, that early morning, I was getting ready to um, getting to go to work. I worked that day, early morning. All right, and what did you do after you got off of work that day? Um, I, after I could get up from work, I received a text uh, from my son, and he's texting me, Mom, are you going to go get the tickets for the premiere from Batman? And I text him, yeah, I'm going to go after I get off. So I got off at 4 o'clock and ran on to the theater to go get the tickets. Who were you going with to the movies that night? Uh, that night I was with, I was going to go with my daughter, Kimberly, my son. My daughter, Kimberly. And could you please state everyone's last name as well, please? Okay. Kimberly Gonzalez, uh, Juan Daniel Gonzalez, Giovanni Lopez, Rolando Salas, and Juan Carlos Mendoza. Could you please tell us the age of everyone who is with you? Kimberly at that time was, I believe, 10. Giovanni was 12, Rolando was 13, Carlos was 17, and my son was 15. Were you all able to go to the movie theater together that night? Yes, we did. Did you pick up everybody and bring them all to the theater that night? That night, um, I was going to, yes, I did pick up everybody, my daughter, my son, uh, Giovanni, I went and pick up Giovanni, and Carlos had, um, he had to go on his own with my nephews, my nephew Rolando. What time did you get to the movie theater that night? I got there between 9 o'clock p.m. Do you recall what theater number you went into that night? Theater 9. How did you go about choosing your seats? We just, um, we always like to see the other way in the back. Every time we go to see a premiere, um, me and my kids like to see the other way in the back to the middle, the second row from the back. Is that where you sat that night on July 20th of 2012? Yes, we sit there. Uh, we we see all the seats because it was pretty empty because we got there so early. So we can see the best seats, I mean, going to the back, because that's the way, I mean, we love sitting in the back of the theater. So we're like, oh, there goes some good seats in the middle, in the back, in that second front row, I mean, second row from the back, between the middle. What would you do while you were waiting for the movie to begin? Uh, we got some popcorns, we got some ices, my kids. Uh, my nephew at that time was my, still my nephew, Giovanni, was with us, and um, we were, my kids were on their phone playing, um, my daughter the same, my nephew's listening to music on their phones. Did, uh, at any point in time, the kids have to go to the bathroom or anything? Mm, no, not at that time. What happened that night in the movie theater? Well, we started uh, that night. Um, the premier star from the movies, we all were sitting down. And um, I saw my daughter next to me. And she was kind of anxious and jumping. And I go, are you OK? And she goes, yeah, I'm fine. Calls for, excuse me, objection calls for hearsay. Sustained. So you had observations that your daughter was nervous? Yes. OK. 
And then at some point in time, did the movie start? The movie starts, yes. It was premium, so. What do you recall happening during the movie that evening? During the movie, I remember um, the movie starting. The last thing that I see, I mean, the first thing that we're, um, I saw some, some, something coming through, through the, um, the right side. It was like, I mean, um, I thought it was a stink bomb at that time. What do you recall after the stink bomb that you saw? I'm, I'm sorry? What do you remember after seeing the stink bomb? Oh, I remember saying, oh, they got the kids are playing a game. I mean, I go like, these teenagers are going to ruin the muse, the movie. I mean, they're going to start with their stink bombs. And, and then I realized that um, this, uh, I realized it was too smoke. And then uh, from there, I st we're still watching the movies. When uh, we're watching the movies, I remember the scene that when the cat woman was into the computer or something, I wasn't putting that much attention because I was already concerned about that stink bomb. But um, I remember that I was seeing the, the last scene of the movie when uh, the cat woman was into the deck, something like that. And then I start sh hearing a lot of sh gunshots shooting, and it was so dark and it was so smoky at that time. Did you see one? The cat woman walks into the desk, is that what you said? Oh, the cat woman, when it's the scene, the cat woman walks into the computer or something. I mean, that's the last thing that I remember about the movie. And so, yeah, I start hearing all these um, shooting guns. And then I heard somebody in the front, I mean, in the front of where I was, they shooting and now they shooting us. So we start, um, Doc, I mean, I put my kids, I go, get down, get down, they're shooting, and I said, who's shooting this? I was so confused. I'm like, what's going on? So did you and the kids, in fact, get down at that point? We did. We did. At one point, um, I realized that my nephew, Rolando, uh, I, I, didn't fit, I didn't fit him, that he was bad. I mean, ducking as we were, so I pushed him down. And when I push him down, I just collapsed myself, like something blew into my right ear. And I'm like, I got hit, I got hit. But then um, I was like, I couldn't see nothing to smoke, too, too dark. I'm like, what's going on, what's going on? I'm thinking to myself, I, could, I dropped myself down with him. And I thought I was hit because I couldn't get up anymore. I wanted to run in there. I wanted to run from there with my kids. I was so scared, scared for them, and then I had, I just have to pull them. I pulled my daughter, and I put my nephew, and then we just run out from there. How was it that you were able to run out from the theater? I'm sorry? What direction did you run out of the theater? We ran out from the right, uh, left direction to the exit door that was next to where we were sitting. Governor, if I may approach the witness with what's been marked as People's Exhibit 1136. Yes. Ms. hernandez Mermije, do you recall having an opportunity to look at that document before? Yes. Right. And were you able to notate on that document where you were seated that night with your family? Yes. Right. Does it fairly and accurately represent what you remember happening in the theater on July 20th of 2012? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I move for the admission of People's Exhibit 1136. Is there any objection? No objection. Without objection, Exhibit P-TR-1136 is admitted and may be published. If I could please have People's Exhibit 1136. Ms. Mamihe, I'm going to ask you a favor. There's a cordless microphone up there. If you could grab that cordless microphone. Do you see that up there anywhere? If you could turn that on for me, please. And then right behind you, on this ledge behind you, there's a large stick. If I could ask you to stand up with a microphone. Back there. There you go. Thank you. Now, if you could please describe for the jury. Whoops, sorry, there's a little step up sorry. there. You okay? Sorry. All right. And if you could just describe for the jury where you were seated that night and explain to them how the order of your seating with your family. Okay, this is me. 
This is Rolando, my nephew. This is Carlos, and this is Dan, Juan Daniel Danny, I call him Danny, Camberly, and Giovanni. Okay. And you notated on there that you fell a second time. Can you tell the jury about what happened there? Yes, uh, when I, when I, I w when I was coming down, when we were coming down, I grabbed Rolando, and I was, uh, I was like, I felt between here, and then when we were coming out to the, out to the door, I felt right here down, again. All right, were you able to get up? I'm sorry. Were you able to get up? I was, I right. was hard, but I was getting up because I want to get my kids out of there because I don't know what at that time what was going on. I just can see people like um, jumping one to another and another state to come out to the exit door. And that's our exit at the very top. This one right here from from here to here. All right. Thank you. And if you could just put that stick down, but I'm going to ask you to approach me at the model so you could also just show the jury on this model where that exit door is, please, if I have the court's permission. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. So if you could point out on here where your seats were for the jury. Right here. All right, and then if you could show the jury on the model where it was that you were able to exit. Through here. Okay, thank you very much. You can take your seat. And you could just turn that microphone off for me, please. Thank you. Now, after you were able to exit through the top um, of the theater, where did you go? I ran down the stairs with all my kids. I saw, when I was running down with my kids, um, I saw a girl bleeding, and I just... Down her 403. Overruled. You can tell the jury what you saw. I just um, saw a um, girl with blood in her shirt, and we ran out. I took out with my kids out of the theater that time. Were you able to get all your kids in the car and drive away from the theater that night? Yes. What happened when you went home? When I, when I got home, I remember getting to my sister's house, and she's like, what's wrong? I mean... Motion to hear say. Sustained. All right, so without saying what your sister said, what happened to you physically when you got home? Oh, I collapsed myself to the couch when I got into my sister. I started vomiting, um, started having tremendous headache, like a big headache, and my neck was hurting in the back. Did you then go to the hospital? Uh, my sister took me to the hospital. What happened when you got to the hospital? I got submitted. I mean, I was waiting in the, in the emergency room at the university hospital. And they were saying what was wrong with me. And I was having too much nausea and vomiting. And my knee was bruised, my left knee. I have no further questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Any cross-examination, Ms. Spangler? No, thank you. All right. The jury does not appear to have any questions, so may this witness be released from her subpoena, Ms. Tishmaguire? Please, thank you, Your Honor. Is there any objection? No. All right, ma'am, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Members of the jury, it's 10 till 12, so let's go ahead and take our lunch break. We took an early morning break, so I think it's a good idea to take our lunch break now. Please remember all the advisements that I've given you and make sure you comply with all of them during the lunch break, and I'll see you back here in an hour and a half, which makes it an, uh, 120, okay? Thank you. Enjoy your lunch.
The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Uh, everyone may be seated. Is there anything we need to uh, talk about at this time on behalf of the people? No, Your Honor. On behalf of the defense? Which I just wondered if at some point I could get take a look at Exhibit 1120, which was the diagram to check the redaction on the diagram that was admitted during Corbin Date's testimony yesterday. Yes. We'll, uh, we'll retrieve that for you. Would you do that, please? Thank you. All right. Anything else? No? Okay. Enjoy your lunch, folks. Thank you. The court will be in recess.